Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming over for the uh, latest installment of the International Security Speaker Series, which is the long-running program to which the Strauss Center brings a wide variety of uh, individuals to campus to talk about the latest scholarship, their latest policy doings, a wide variety of things. Uh, today, we are especially pleased to welcome Professor James Whitman, who holds a JD from Yale Law School, a PhD from Chicago, and is currently the Ford Foundation Professor of Comparative and Foreign Law at Yale. Jim is the author of a number of books and, and a large number of articles. I won't attempt to recite the articles. I will mention the books. In 2004, he published Harsh Justice, Criminal Punishment and the Widening Divide Between America and Europe. Four years later, in 2008, he published The Origins of Reasonable Doubt, Theological Roots of the Criminal Trial. And four years after that, this past year, The Verdict of Battle, the Law of Victory and the Making of Modern War, Harvard University Press. Uh, it's a tremendous book. I was, I was attempting to prove to Jim earlier that I had actually read it because, as you see here, it's actually underlined. And I was careful when I opened it to make sure it was a page with, with stars and smiley faces in the margins rather than large question marks and angry <laughs> underscores of, of doubt. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book that explains the uh, peculiarly legal function that pitched battle once performed in, in Europe in particular, and further to that, the manner in which that legal function had the effect of constraining the overall destructiveness of war in a time period well before we reached the, the Lieber Code, the Geneva Conventions, the Hague Regulations. And it's to some extent a counterintuitive thesis, but it's a fascinating one and exceptionally well argued. Uh, so without further ado, I present to you Professor Richard Whitman. Gee, thanks so much, Bobby, um, and thanks to you all for, for coming. I mean, I'd like to imagine everybody had already read this book, but I figure that's not the case. Um, so I'd better describe it to you. Bobby um, began, um, uh, actually did a great job of giving you the basic idea uh, in the book. The book is indeed about pitched battles. Uh, and the claim, as he said, uh, is indeed that particularly in the 18th century, a time when warfare was generally confined to the battlefield, to the fighting of, of pitched battles. Warfare was, in fact, among military historians uh, and, uh, and specialists in the law of war, remarkably civilized, both by comparison with what came before and what came, def came after. Now, that, that presents really a puzzle. It's a great puzzle. Why should the high uh, age of civilized warfare, how can it be that the high age of civilized warfare predates the rise of the modern law of war? and of the modern humanitarian attitudes that guide us in our thinking about, about the law of war. That's, that's the puzzle that I address uh, in the book. Uh, and indeed, the, the centerpiece of the book is the pitched battle. Now, a pitched battle, let me begin by saying, is a remarkable institution. It's a truly remarkable institution, uh, understood historically by lawyers as a form of legal procedure, a kind of trial. Uh, a, a form of trial by combat, in fact, understood in the Middle Ages in particular as a judgment of God. Uh, it is indeed, as or can be when it succeeds, which doesn't happen all the time, uh, can indeed function as a kind of legal procedure comparable to trial. And a remarkable legal procedure. That is, if you can convince the combatants to con restrain themselves to battle within the battlefield, if you can keep the fighting from spilling off the battlefield into society at large, uh, you've done a remarkable job in civilizing warfare. And if you can convince the combatants to accept, giving you the title of the book, the verdict of battle, you've managed to resolve warfare in a remarkably contained way. Now, we all understand, who work in the field, that the 18th century was especially successful in achieving this kind of containment of warfare. The question, once again, is how? Well, in the book, I try to show that the basic understanding of the law of war that guided the fighting of wars in the 18th century was very different indeed from our basic understanding of the law of war. Very different indeed. Uh, in the modern world, we think of the law of war as committed fundamentally or as part of a larger humanitarian project. We think of the great task of the law of war as doing everything it can to eliminate the suffering entailed by war. None of that was exactly true. In fact, none of it was true in the 18th century. Their understanding of the law of war was very, very different. 
They understood, we think of the law of war today as closely akin to criminal law. We think of just wars as just wars in the sense that one side uh, in the pursuit of the defense of the good aims to, uh, to combat the evil that's, 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 that's threatened by the other side. That's not the way they understood things at all. They didn't think of the law of war as closely akin to, the, to criminal law. They thought of the law of war as closely akin to property law. The law of war, from their point of view, was, or war was, a legitimate means of the acquisition of property. Now, let me say, that, what should be obvious to all of you, that sounds absolutely sinister from our point of view. Right? The idea that you would go to war in order to acquire property, in particular territory, Sounds like the, almost the definition of the most sinister attitude toward warfare one might have. Uh, the charge that, 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 that warring parties go to war in order to gain profit is probably the ugliest charge leveled against wars these days. What is it we said about Iraq? Americans just went into it for the oil, right? What could be more sinister than that? Yet this, to us, sinister attitude that dominated in the 18th century contributed greatly to the civilization of warfare in the 18th century. At least that's my claim. Now, how was a war understood in the 18th century? A war, as I said at the beginning, was understood as a kind of legal procedure. Now, this again seems sinister to us. The basic understanding in the 18th century and in the 19th century was the understanding that was rejected in the Kellogg-Briand Pact, for those of you who know your history of the law of war, the Kellogg-Briand Pact rejected the idea that a war could be used as a means of resolving conflict, as a kind of procedure for resolving conflict. The understanding after Kellogg-Briand was that war could only be used in desperate circumstances when, when, when the needs of self-defense, in effect, required it. That wasn't true in the 18th century and the 19th century. The understanding of a war was that a war was an appropriate means of conflict resolution. It was a way of deciding a dispute between sovereigns and coming back to where I was before, it was a way of deciding a dispute between sovereigns, especially over territory, but generally over material claims. It was a kind of trial, a way of, well, as I say, resolving disputes. Now, the disputes in question were understood as legal disputes. The wars that were fought in the 18th century in particular involved legal disputes that grew out of the law of dynastic succession. That's why wars in the 18th century had, as we lawyers say, the captions that they had. They had legal captions. The War of the Spanish Succession, the War of the Austrian Succession, the War of the Polish Succession. The wars were understood to be legal procedures used to resolve disputes between sovereigns who had colorable legal claims to the crown of Spain, to title to Silesia, for example, in the first Austrian war, to the crown of Poland, as the case might be. And the war was used as a means of resolving their legal conflict as a kind of trial. The war had to be used as a legal means of resolving their conflict because wars were wars between sovereigns. And it was understood that it was in the nature of being a sovereign that one's disputes could never be resolved by a court of law. Sovereigns had to have some other means of settling their legal quarrels they had to resort to what was called in the law of the 18th century, the chance of arms. They had to resolve their quarrels by uh, uh, trial by combat. Now, as I say, to repeat what I said before, all of this sounds extraordinarily sinister from our point of view. All of this sounds extraordinarily sinister from our point of view. That the killing of war should be used as a means of resolving a mere dispute over, sovereignty, over territory between sovereigns that war in general should be understood as an entirely legitimate way of claiming property rights. All of that sounds awful, and yet the paradox, to come back to it once again, is that the 18th century was famously a period of extraordinarily civilized warfare. Why could it be a period of such civilized warfare? Well, I have a few answers uh, to offer in the book. And let me say one more thing about it before, before going on. There was a further understanding about the battles that were fought, these trials by combat fought between sovereigns that has to be mentioned. Everybody involved, the lawyers involved, the commanders involved, everybody who commented on war in the 18th century understood something very important about the battles that they fought to resolve these wars. The results of the battle, the verdict of battle, were the product, as they all understood, of chance. 
to resolve a legal dispute through war was once again to submit one's claims to the chance of arms. That is, they believed that there was an irreducible, ineliminable element of fortuity in the verdict of battle. Now that too, I want to say, is very alien to our way of thinking about things. Very alien to our way of thinking about things. Beginning in the middle of the 19th century, the idea established itself that the results of war, the verdict of a war, if not of the battle, if you like, had to involve a clash between great historic forces. That is, we arrived at the notion that you see perhaps most familiarly to people now uh, for in, World War, uh, in the case of World War II, the notion that World War II, the results of World War II were not just the result of chance. That what World War II embodied was a great historic conflict between, well, from the point of view of, view of the Western powers, liberal democracy and fascism, from the point of view of the Soviets, communism and fascism. But that at any rate, the result of the war reflected a triumph for some much greater, larger principle. Of course, we think that way in current American wars, too. We imagine that we're fighting wars to make the world safe for democracy or, or something else of that kind. We are fighting in the service of a larger conflict over great values that are determining the course of history. Nobody thought that in the 18th century. The universal understanding in the 18th century was that a war and a battle in particular was a kind of a crapshoot. Indeed, the legal analysis of battles in particular were, that, were the following. A battle, fighting a pitched battle, was a means of submitting the dispute at stake in the war. Or the, the parties in entering into the battle entered into what was called a contract, a tacit contract of chance. That is, they agreed to let chance determine which of them would be the victor, which of them would have the legal rights that were ultimately enforceable in claims in court. Now, all three, that too in its own way is not shocking to us, but it's very, very alien. Very difficult for us to accept the proposition, just to come back to my first example, that the results of World War II could have been just chance. We won't accept that. We are deeply committed to the idea that wars have to be fought in the name of great causes and that what's at stake in the fighting of a war is the fate of a great cause, the conflict between one great cause and another great cause. We have that idea, and of course we also have the idea, we're very strongly attached to the idea, that the great cause in question has to be the larger cause of the claims of humanity in some sense. Now, the first thing to say in understanding why warfare was more civilized in the 18th century, or the first thing to acknowledge, it seems to me, is that fighting wars in the name of great causes like that, refusing to allow chance, to determine the outcome, is, in its own way, a formula for wars that cannot be brought to an end. If the wars aren't over until democracy and justice are established, the wars are never going to end. First thing that matters about the 18th century is that nobody thought in those ways. That idea that you're fighting in the name of a great cause, and should only fight in the name of a great cause, and I should emphasize that because our understanding is not just that, as a matter of fact, wars are fought in the name of great causes. Our understanding is that it could not be justified to fight a war except in the name of a great cause because of all the killing involved. That modern attitude has something to do with our difficulty in containing warfare. The absence of that modern attitude, conversely, has a great deal to do with understanding the success of the 18th century in containing warfare. When Frederick the Great in the first, my main example in the book, when Frederick the Great in the First Silesian War managed to claim Silesia, to acquire Silesia in the war against Maria Theresa, and thereby to elevate Prussia into the ranks of the great powers, nobody at the time understood that event as the necessary result of a great historic campaign on behalf of this, that, or the other thing. It was just what happened to happen. And they accepted the notion that war could be just about what happens to happen. That's a big part of why they managed to keep things contained. Another part of why they managed to keep things contained, I want to insist, has to do with what I began with first in this, I'm afraid, somewhat improvised account of what goes on in the book. That is, another critical contributing factor was their understanding of war as an aspect of the law of property as a legitimate means of acquiring, of, of, of pursuing material ends. 
why would something that seems so sinister to us contribute to keeping war within limits? The fundamental answer is very simple. People who fight for material gain are people who can negotiate an end to their wars. People who fight for material gain understand that a point comes at which you ought to cut your losses, try to repair your balance sheet as best as possible, and move on. Now, I want to insist once again that as alien and frightening as that sounds to us, that's not a foolish way to think about war. And indeed, the main conclusions I want to offer as a matter of current normative law from the book have to do with, with, with that. Let me say immediately before somebody asks the question, what I don't mean to say is that we should initiate wars in the way the 18th century initiated wars. That is, that we should fight them for territorial gain or commercial interest. I don't think we should do that. We need a use ad bellum which has some other basis. The advantage of thinking of wars about material gain really presents itself not in the initiation of the war, but in, in the problem of ending the war. The problem that we face desperately in the case of Iraq, that is, we had no idea how to get out again. The advantage of thinking of a war as legitimately producing material advantage for victors is that it makes it possible to negotiate. It makes it possible to walk away, for example, from Iraq saying, well, we got some oil rights. We can claim a kind of victory. Somebody else got something else. We can call a halt and go home. The problem, once again, is that if you're fighting for great causes, you can't call a halt and go home. You can't cut a deal. And in the United States, we found ourselves in very difficult circumstances because we have no way to cut deals. In the 18th century, they had ways to cut deals, and they did cut deals. And as a result, a lot fewer people died. Soldiers died on the battlefield. But off the field, things were remarkably civilized by the standards of what came before or what came after. And there are lessons to be drawn very cautiously from that for modern warfare. There's a third reason why 18th century warfare also was civilized, and it comes back to another, to, in our eyes, or a second in our eyes, sinister aspect of the 18th century law of war. The very fact that they didn't subscribe to the Kellogg-Briand Pact contributed to the civilization of warfare. Yeah, they thought of war as a procedure for resolving disputes. Yes, that sounds awful to us. We don't imagine that it's appropriate to bring about the deaths of thousands or millions in order to resolve a dispute. Thousands in the case of the 18th century. But the advantage of thinking about that, things that way in the 18th century is the following. Procedures have rules. Because they understood that their wars were procedures, they also understood that there was a standard procedure, a standard way of resolving the dispute. And the standard way of resolving the dispute was on the battlefield not off the battlefield. They did not fight what had been fought in the Thirty Years' War and would be fought again, wars of general devastation. They were willing, with some reservations, and I can go into it in detail, they were willing, with some reservations, to accept the verdict of the battlefield without feeling any obligation to do what we feel an obligation, felt an obligation to do in World War II, that is, to fight until everybody else on the other side was dead or so prostrated that they could not fight any longer. That had to do in a very straightforward way, I insist, as a, as a lawyer. That had to do in a very straightforward way with the fact that they did understand the war to be a kind of a procedure for resolving conflicts. Sounds awful to us, contributed tremendously to the civilization of warfare in the 18th century. Tremendous. Committed, uh, contributed tremendously. Now, how, how long shall I talk for? I mean, I can say much more about the, the book. For, for a fair amount more, okay. Now, in describing all of this, there I want to get a little bit more deeply into the historical mysteries. In describing all of this, I've talked about the 18th century. Let me talk a little more about how the 18th century world came to an end, because that's an important part of the story, too, as a matter of military and, and, and legal history. Again, there is a general understanding, let me, let me emphasize, a, a general understanding, not universally shared, but I think an absolutely correct understanding that war in the 18th century was civilized, by which nobody means to say that war wasn't awful. Of course it was awful. The claim is not that things were all fought you know, with the showers of rose petals in the 18th century. It was pretty awful to be on an 18th century battlefield. It's just better than what came before and after. The question is, why that, that 
culture of pitched battles that we find in the 18th century came to an end. So let me now turn to that topic and, and, and describe the end of the uh, 18th century culture. Now, what's remarkable about the 18th century culture, once again, uh, is its relative success, its considerable success, in containing warfare to the battlefield. Very, very rare that you see wars of general devastation. In the 18th, really, you don't see them in the, in the 18th century at all. When did that successful practice of, of, of pitched battle end? Well, the first thing to observe is that it didn't end when people often say it did with the French Revolution. It didn't end when people say it did in the French Revolution. The Napoleonic Wars, in particular, continued to be fought in the form of pitched battles. And indeed, we continue to see wars resolved through pitched battle right down into the 1860s and 1870s. It's in the 1860s and 1870s that the old practice of pitched battle broke down. And in trying to understand why that happened, we can get yet more insight than what I've tried to offer so far into why the 18th century enjoyed the successes in civilizing warfare that the 18th century enjoyed. <clears throat> Let me take you then to the 1860s and 1870s and then talk about the historical explanation. Right down into let's say 1859 is a nice choice. We see very pitch battles very successfully resolving conflict. The battle in 1859 that I have in mind is the Battle of Solferino, which established effectively the independence of Italy. It was, as you may know, the battle that was famously witnessed by Henri Dunant, who wrote his famous pamphlet denouncing the horrors of the battlefield. Um, thus triggering the establishment of the International Red Cross and modern uh, international humanitarian movements. What I want to insist on, though, in describing the Battle of Solferino and a couple of other battles from the same war, is that it was a battle that was extraordinarily successful in resolving its war. It had tremendous consequences, and didn't, which didn't entail any kind of general war of devastation. As late as then, 1859, Everybody understood that wars would be fought in the form of pitched battles. And indeed, even down to the end of the 1860s, in some cases, wars were still fought in the form of pitched battles. What I have in mind in particular is the Battle of Königgrätz in 1867, in what's sometimes called the Seven Weeks War between Prussia and Austria. Again, a remarkably successful battle, a one-day pitched battle that resolved the dispute without any war of general devastation spilling off the battlefield. So that it was still possible in 1866 to do that, but it's clear that the culture of pitch battle was breaking down nevertheless, and we can see that it's clear by looking at two other wars of the period. First, the American Civil War, and second, the Franco-Prussian War. When the American Civil War began, it was universally assumed that it would be resolved through battlefield conflict. Uh, and indeed, we got one of my favorite phenomena, we were talking about it earlier today, uh, in the mid-19th century, uh, battle tourism as folks went out with picnic baskets dressed in their Sunday finery to witness the battles that they thought would resolve the dispute in Virginia. Of course, what happened in the American Civil War is that the battles signally failed to resolve the dispute, up to and including especially the Battle of Gettysburg, regarded by all observers as a clearly decisive battle that nevertheless failed to, nevertheless failed to decide the war. As you can see, you can, and you, what happened instead dramatizes the alternative to battle warfare. Instead, the American Civil War was, was resolved through a battle of general devastation, namely Sherman's March to the Sea. The old culture of resolving matters through the verdict of battle had collapsed in America. This same old culture also collapsed in the Franco-Prussian War, in some ways even more dramatically. So in 1870, September 1st, 1870, uh, the Prussians spectacularly defeated the French at the Battle of Sedan. Again, observers described it as the most successful, decisive battle of all time. Uh, the Prussians managed to pull off something that everybody was always trying to pull off but failing to pull off, namely a, a successful encirclement. It worked. They won. The entire French army surrendered. Napoleon III, who was the emperor, formally handed over his sword, which in the international law of the day signaled decisive defeat. Despite that fact, though, the general French population reacted the way the general population of the American South did in 1863. They refused to accept the verdict of the battle. And the story, for those of you who know French history, is famous to all French school children. The, the populace of Paris gathered at the Place de la Concorde 
the voices of reason said to them, you are mad that there is nothing between the Prussian troops and us, you are all going to be slaughtered, which is of course what eventually did happen. Nevertheless, they refused to accept the verdict of the battle, and the Prussians, like the, uh, the American Northerners a few years before, were obliged to engage in a war of general devastation, reducing the French cities one by one. So what we see in both of those wars is the failure, entirely unexpected failure, of pitch battle culture. Everybody going into those wars had thought that the war would still be resolved by pitch battles, just as the wars had been resolved by pitch battles in the Napoleonic Wars. So the great historic mystery in trying to understand how 18th century culture declined is why it should have declined then. Now military historians, when they address that, that problem, and legal historians for that matter, and specialists in international law, give two answers, both of which I would put it to you are inadequate answers. I'll give you my answer after that. The first answer, commonly given, very commonly given by military historians, is that the fighting of pitched battles became impossible because of developments in military technology. Now, this is repeated very frequently. A couple of aspects of, military tech, of developing military technology are, are mentioned. Rifles took the place of muskets, as you may know. I could say more about rifles and muskets. But this looks like the kind of audience that knows all about rifles and muskets. So I don't think I have to do that. What? I, we are in Texas. We, in Texas, they still use muskets. Don't they? Right. You got them all? Right. You got them all? Yeah. But you should know the Second Amendment really refers only to muskets. This is very important because, uh, anyway, the uh, uh, rifles took the place of muskets, and the armies grew much, much bigger, much bigger than they had been in the 18th century. And these are the two, also railroads came in. So both the Prussians and the American uh, Northerners used railroads. If you read the standard texts, they'll tell you that that's why things changed in the 1860s and 1870s. And I put it to you that that's no explanation at all. If it had been technologically impossible to fight battles, there wouldn't have been any battles, but there were. Kurnisch Gretz was an entirely successful battle. Sedan was an entirely successful battle, and the French and the Prussians at Sedan had the most advanced arms available at the time. The French arms were even better than the Prussian arms, as it happens. Uh, much more advanced than what you find in the American Civil War. There were railroads used in both of these cases. That didn't mean you couldn't fight a battle. The armies were huge, just as they've been huge at the Battle of Leipzig. It's just not the case that it became technologically impossible to fight pitched battles. They did them. What happened was not that it was technologically impossible to fight them, but that people would no longer accept the verdict. The change has to be a change in political culture, the social understanding of the significance of the battle, not in the technology. Now, having said that, I'll add that it did become technologically impossible to fight the classic kind of battle, which in, in the older law is known as an open confrontation. So, you know, you expose your chest like this in battle. That became impossible in 1914. That should have been obvious to everybody then. But not until 1914. So, by the way, with regard to muskets and rifles, it's often said that rifles were more destructive than muskets. But, in fact, all the studies show that they weren't. The practice of fighting battles was, was, not, was not transformed by the introduction of rifles. So, the first explanation that can't be a correct explanation is that technological change was at work. There's another explanation that you'll find very commonly among specialists in international law, especially in other historians, recently revived in particular by David Bell, who's a historian at Princeton, a former friend of mine until I wrote this book. Well, that's long. Uh, which is the following, very interesting, and, and in some ways useful, but fundamentally wrong. The following explanation, according to David or Carl Schmidt, if you know who Carl Schmidt was or others. Battle warfare was successful in the 18th century because battles, these trials by combat that I, that I described, were really a form of dueling. What dominated in the 18th century, according to this theory, was aristocratic culture. So that what happened in the 19th century was, and what happened in the 19th century is that aristocratic culture vanished or broke down or something like that. So that people were no longer willing to fight duels in this way. Now, there is a lot to be said about that argument. There is a connection between dueling and trial by combat. But here again, I want to reject this very forcefully and offer a very different, or do in the book, offer a very different explanation. It can't be right to describe 18th century battle warfare as a form of dueling. If you read what the 18th century lawyers themselves said about it, and others as well, the first thing that they say is that a battle is not a duel. The first thing that they say about their warfare is a critical thing, 
that I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on. The first thing they say about warfare in the 18th century, if you ask Vatel, for example, he's dead, but if you had been able to ask Vatel, if you read what Vatel said or others, the great 18th century lawyers, they, their explanation for the high level of civilization in their warfare is the following. They say, our warfare has attained a high civilization, a level of civilization because there are only public wars now and not private wars. What did they mean by that? They were referring to a phenomenon we've forgotten, but one that was very important in Europe. There was private warfare down until the end of the 17th century. Nobles had their own armies. They too, just like kings, claimed the right to resolve their legal disputes through war. They marched out with their followers in uniform, their armed followers, and tried to have their way against their enemies. The critical thing from the point of view of 18th century observers about the civilization of 18th century warfare is that the monarchs had finally succeeded in suppressing private warfare, had finally succeeded in insisting that only sovereigns could fight wars to resolve their disputes, that all wars in the jargon of the 18th century had to be public wars. Now that is the critical fact about, the, a, an additional critical fact about the 18th century, and I want to insist on it. I want to insist on it. Why was 18th century warfare so civilized? It was so civilized in part, in addition to the things I've already said, because it was an activity restricted to legitimate monarchs who had succeeded in the terms of Max Weber in laying sole claim to the monopoly of legitimate military violence. They were the only people allowed to go out and lead guys in uniforms into war and shoot other people. The association of war with monarchy was extraordinarily strong, and I want to insist on that too because it leads us to an understanding of the phenomenon I already suggested must be present. That is, the political context, the political culture that lies in the background of the way the wars are fought. These wars were contained wars because they, in part because they could only be fought by monarchs, by legitimate monarchs, whose legitimacy was demonstrated by the fact that they could go to war. They were sovereigns, and what that meant was that they resolved their disputes through the chance of arms and not by going to court. And of course, their glory that they were seeking was always, as part of reinforcing their legitimacy, was glory they sought in war. This was a monarchical system. Now, there are a couple of things to say about that before I pass on to what happened in the 19th century, about this monarchical system uh, in the 18th century. The first thing that, well, first, it's important things to be recognized, that Americans ought to recognize in talking about this monarchical system. The monarchical system that I'm describing involved, in particular, standing armies, something rejected by the Americans. It involved disarmament of the general population, something also rejected by Americans. A lot of what we see in our Constitution, although we no longer recognize it, represents a rejection of the monarchical form of government you saw in the 18th century. A rejection of a monarchical form of government, for example, in the form of standing armies that I want to insist contributed greatly to the civilization of warfare in the 18th century, so that it was a delicate matter rejecting it for the Americans. I'll come back to that in a moment. The second thing I want to say for those of you who know the law of war is that this association between war and monarchy was extraordinarily strong for 18th century philosophers too. This is why, to choose only the most famous and important one, Kant insisted that in a world of republics there would be no war. Of course he had a, a more nuanced account of why that was the case. He thought there would be no war in a world of republics because the taxpayers in republics would never agree to finance wars. But the main thing to insist on is that he took for granted what everybody in the 18th century took for granted. Wars were fought by monarchs. Republics would never do it. Now, with that background, let me now turn to what happened in the 19th century. What do we see happening in the 19th century? I think it's very straightforward. The association between pitched battle warfare of the kind I've been describing and monarchy was very, very close. And when we look at the successful battles I've described, Solferino in 1859, Königgrätz, in 1866, what we are seeing are wars, battles in wars fought between monarchs. What was the difference in the American Civil War, or for that matter in another horrifically out of control bloody war that preceded it, the Mexican War? We are seeing, or for that matter, in the Franco-Prussian War, which resulted in the establishment of the, of the French Third Republic, we are seeing wars involving republics. <laughs> 
And that's the critical fact in understanding why the old pitch battle system broke down. It broke down because contrary to what Kant would have us believe, not only is it the case that republics turned out to fight wars in the 19th century, they turned out to fight much worse wars. Now again, the drive in all of this is much the same as you can see, for better or for worse. It's to insist that a lot of what seems objectionable and evil in the 18th century to us actually contributed to civilizing the warfare. Now, I, I don't want you to, I don't want to end my presentation of all this by suggesting that I think we really ought to go back to having 18th century monarchies. I don't think we ought to go back to having 18th century monarchies. That would be very foolish. But I do think that what we can get out of this history, once we understand it correctly, is a little more salutary skepticism about the costs of our value commitments in war. You can fight wars for humanitarian ends, for great causes. You certainly can. You certainly can do that. You can fight wars for democracy. You can do all of those things. But you're doing a very poor job as a public citizen, certainly as a lawyer, if you happen to be a lawyer, if you don't try to weigh the costs against the benefits. It's as straightforward as that. You must weigh the costs against the benefits. If you want to fight wars for great causes, they are very likely to be the kind of wars we've, been, we've fought in the 20th century and are fighting now. Maybe we want to do that, but we ought to understand what it is we're committing ourselves when we, when, when we do that. And understanding how things were different in the past makes it easier for us to recognize what the, what the costs are. And that's really all in the end that I mean to claim out of all of this, apart from saying that maybe it wouldn't be such a bad thing if we ended wars by giving people claim to oil or other material advantages, as sinister as it sounds to us. So I'll stop there. I haven't said anything, for example, about diplomacy, which plays a large role in this story, or many other things. But I'd be happy to take questions about the, what I've said, if you that bother you. Jim, I'll start it off. Uh, first of all, that was a, a wonderful summation of, of, a, of a very dense book. I'm, I'm amazed how much that you got into that statement. I think it really conveyed to everybody exactly what was going on in the book. Um, contemporaneous with the transition you identified there in, in the mid to late 19th century, uh, this is also overlapping with the emergence of the Libra Code, which, which right. was immediately adopted and, and promoted right. by European correspondents like Libra and others. And it entered, it entered us into the, the age of the, the positive law, the use right. of and the attempt to perhaps subconsciously or otherwise compensate for the loss of the constraints that you identified right. with uh, positive law and actions and codification. Can you talk about why that failed on this account to, to provide an offsetting set of well, so two things. I'll take it as two questions. Or, or I'll agree with the first observation. Yes, I think consciously or unconsciously, this, what emerged with the Libra Code and after was a substitute for the forms of control of war that had existed before. It's absolutely, that's right, you must say it. And Libra, the Libra Code was, of course, a creation of 1863. That is, it, 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 it is entirely, exactly contemporaneous with the Battle of Gettysburg. How strong the sense was in Francis Lieber's mind or the minds of others that this was a necessary substitute for a vanishing form of war, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But as you say, this was, whether conscious or unconscious, the connection is, is too clear to be, to, to be neglected uh, in some form. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. I want to say one thing about it before passing on to the second part of your question, though. The, the mistake that we must avoid making is to assume that there was no law of war, in effect, as people sometimes say, until Francis Lieber. That's just not true. There was plenty of law of war, and it was very effective law of war, and I do want to insist on that. We, we, we just have, are suffering from a kind of historical amnesia that's, that's undermined our efforts to do, to do good in the world. I think that, I do want to say that. As for the second part of your question, I, I don't know how to say whether the particular provisions of the Libra Code have failed or not, right? I mean, now, so I don't mean to say, or some of the other Geneva Code provisions. I mean, I, it, I do not mean to say that there shouldn't be a modern use in Bellow or a modern IHL or anything like this is international humanitarian law. I don't mean to say that there shouldn't be battlefield rules. Why would anybody say that? I, I, I don't mean to claim that. That's not the question. The question is whether the larger spirit, A, of the larger spirit of humanitarianism, and B, the larger tendency to think of war, or the law of war, as most closely akin to criminal law, whether those two tendencies have done damage. And I think those two tendencies have done damage. Whether Francis Lieber or anybody else involved was really quite meaning to push in those directions, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, well, can I tell you, we've... Go ahead in the back. Yeah. 
so nationalism is obviously important in, in a certain sense. Let me just expand a little bit on your question. I mentioned it very briefly. One of the critical contributing factors, as all military historians know, to the success of the 18th century in containing warfare had to do with the establishment of royal standing armies, which were mercenary in the narrow sense that they were made up of soldiers who were actually paid, which means they didn't have to feed themselves through general pillage. Um, uh, and I do want to insist that when we rejected standing armies in the, in the American Revolution, that's what we were rejecting, right? The main contribution from most military historians' point of view to the civilization of warfare in the 18th century. So this should give us a little, a little bit of pause. You're right, too, that afterwards, especially with the Levee en masse in, in France, we get national armies. Is nationalism really the culprit? Well, I think yes and no, right? I mean, nationalism is one of those great causes that obviously can lead people in dangerous directions from my point of view. On the other hand, much of the nationalism in, for example, uh, the wars of Italian independence was filtered through an idea of monarchical government. And for that reason, it, these, the, the, the wars involved managed to be contained wars. At least that's what I would argue. Once again, the same is true of the Battle of Leipzig, for example, a very famous battle with enormous armies with all sorts of nationalistic ideas floating around. Nevertheless, the armies were fighting on behalf of monarchical principles. So I don't think that nationalism as such offers the kind of explanation it can be said to offer. To the extent that the nationalism does offer an explanation, what I do want to insist on is this. The standard Carl Schmitt, David Bell explanation points to populist nationalism as the alternative to aristocratic government. That, I think, is wrong. I think there was populist nationalism in, in the American Civil War, in the Franco-Prussian War, but what matters most about it is that it was anti-monarchical and not anti-aristocratic. And, and that would be my ultimate answer. But of course, it plays a role as, as you know, the embodiment of a new sense of national self or something like that. I just want to reject the aristocratic story that we, we see so often. That's right. Uh, fascinating talk. Probably about 10 to 20 questions, comments. So I'm just going to limit it to three um, to get your response. The, the first is that I think you correctly emphasize standing armies is that they're extraordinarily expensive, right? And so when I think about what makes it possible, you are taking um, the most productive males out of the economy, you're training, you're garrisoning them, you're feeding them, you're giving them uniforms, you're training them, you require them to be literate, they be disciplined. It's very, very expensive. So just, I don't, you may not disagree, but when I think of the 18th century and standing armies, I think of the financial revolution, the rise of the administrative state, the kind of mm -hmm. So I was wondering about your comment on that. Um, the second is that I was wondering Napoleon's invasion of Russia and retreat, uh -huh. how that fits in, because it seems as if the Russians don't, they don't accept the verdict, they don't even accept the trial. And then of right. course the retreat, the, the Napoleonic forces are quite weakened by para, paramilitary activity right. that doesn't fall into normal pitch battles, so they lose the real war. Third point, one of the things I think that your insights would provide real kind of a, a profound understanding of is that I think you're completely right that war is a procedure by delegitimizing it from Tel Aviv on dawn, you actually create real problems and that there's these political pressures that if war is delegitimized, the underlying causes don't go away, but you remove a tool. And what I'm thinking about here is redrawing borders. And in many parts of the world, particularly say Africa, where there were borders that were poorly drawn as a result of imperialism or there's great disputes, yet the international community sees war as this unmitigated evil. In fact, those underlying pressures don't go away. You will have civil war or messier forms of war, and probably you know, a, a greater level of human tragedy than if, in fact, a more 18th century sort of style, let's try to kind of figure this out through interstate war, which right. will sort of happen. That was just kind of a crazy thought that came into my head while you were talking. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's crazy, but I'm kind of for it. But let, let me start with the first two questions. Yeah, there's lots to say about standing armies. I won't give a f the full answer that I might want to give, but I I'll just endorse what you say, but put a, a historical sociological spin on it. Yes, what, the standing armies were made possible by the creation of much more powerful extractive states. This is another paradox that I, and I've written about it in criminal law too. Strong states often are good things, not bad 
it's very difficult to understand the success of the 18th century unless you recognize how much absolutist state building lay in the background of what was going on, and that's part of my claim about the monopoly on uh, legitimate military violence. Yeah, I mean, this is because they had strong states. Now, and this, what you're describing are some aspects of a, of a strong state. There are other things to say, but I won't go into it. Uh, yes, as for not only the case of Russia, but especially, of course, the Peninsular War, we did see guerrilla warfare emerging in, in the Napoleonic period. I say a little about, about there. I didn't want to go in too much into the period here. The main thing I want to insist on is that although it did emerge, nobody seemed to know what, nobody knew what to make of it, right? They, they didn't think that it represented the normal way of doing war. The standard wars were still fought in, in, in battle form, despite Borodino, which is a great example of a war where the, 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 the loser refused to accept the verdict. And Napoleon was furious about that, by the way. He goes on and on about how they lost, they should have just accepted the verdict, which he expected. So it's not that things weren't changing. It's that the culture of the law of war hadn't recognized that things were changing. That's also true of the Mexican War. People just didn't realize what was going on, and that's what matters. And correspondingly, the law of war had no category like guerrilla war until Francis Lieber. I mean, they just didn't know what to do with it. They had no understanding. On your last question, I, I don't think it's that crazy. So two observations. One, yeah, these were wars fought over territory. Now, one thing you want to say outside of the case of post-colonial Africa, or you know, we could talk about, about Mesopotamia too, for that matter. We have the same kind of lousy border drawing going on. Outside of those cases, one of the striking things about modern warfare is that redrawing borders matters a lot less than it used to. The material interests we're talking about these days really tend to be much more commercial interests. And that, that's important as a working datum for understanding how you could translate what was done in the 18th century. It hasn't vanished entirely. Notably, China is making territorial claims now in kind of the classic way, irredentist territorial claims. So it's not gone but it matters less than it used to matter. As for the, the use of war in the context where, well, you know, I, of course my argument drives me in the direction of endorsing your crazy idea. I, I hesitate to do it. I'd even take it a little, if I were willing to endorse it. How's that? I w this is a Nixonian answer. I would, <laughs> I would even push it a little bit further, having just debated somebody about this, and say that one of the underlying difficulties in sub-Saharan Africa is the unwillingness to accept the legitimacy of the armed forces engaged. That is, if you actually recognize their legitimacy in some sense, it's possible at least that they'll begin to behave in ways that correspond more to what the law of war dictates, because I haven't said it here, that what I'm trying to argue in all of this is what American law professors always argue, namely the law is a system of incentives, you have to give people incentives, because you can give, by, because recognition is a major incentive in international law. Treating people as legitimate actors can succeed in encouraging them to behave in the way you want legitimate actors to behave. If you just make everything illegal, you guarantee banditry instead of, instead of warfare. So I might even be willing to push it further than that. I just hesitate partly out of ignorance of sub-Saharan Africa, partly because I don't want to come out and say, look, let's just go back and fight wars over territory. That would be, I really am not in favor of that. So, go ahead, ma'am. Right. So, so I have. So, uh, 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 that's the one by one objection. I yeah. think it may, yes, the battle in itself seems like a legal event, but it went on and on and on. Uh, the other thing, uh, you sort of reject the notion that technology has something to do with it. And I agree that there's really not much of a difference between the Muslims and the right. But there's a huge difference between the Muslims and the right on the one side and the Kurdish on the other. The reason why. So, so let me answer both those questions, I guess, in turn. Uh, I mean, the first one is, of course, a critical question. I didn't go into it in the book. Uh, and it requires a 
a couple of answers, uh, in effect. Yeah, it's certainly true that the appeals were endless. This has, in, in, in technical legal terms, there's no finality. So Maria Theresa would not accept the, the ultimate verdict of, its, uh, uh, of, of the first Silesian War. That's absolutely right. But despite that fact, I think we have to recognize a couple of truths about 18th century warfare. The, the first is, the question is not is this. It's not just a question of whether the battles are fully decisive in the sense that everybody accepts the verdict without ever challenging it again. The first question is a procedural question. Can we contain the conflict to battlefields at all? So the first observation to make is that even when Maria Theresa challenged the verdict in my maybe slightly forced legal terms of the First Silesian War and the Seven Years' War, she challenged it on the battlefield. And indeed, the orientation of the battlefield was so strong in the Seven Years' War that even though Berlin was occupied twice by enemy forces, it was understood that only defeat on the battlefield would, in the end, mean defeat for Frederick the Great. That's the culture that I'm trying to describe. The, the second thing to say, and you know, so it's, it's much more about whether it's confined to certain procedures than whether the procedures are completely successful. And let me say that we wouldn't expect the procedures to be completely successful since, after all, we're talking about war. This is not, this is the very far limit of where you ex might expect the law actually to succeed. Having said that, though, I do want to reject another claim that's often made by 18th century military historians. You may know the literature or you may, uh, 18th century military historians, but it corresponds to what you've said. What is often said about 18th century war, usually supported by a completely inapposite quote from Gibbon, I must say, is that 18th century warfare was, in the way you describe it, indecisive. That is, the wars went on forever and they never resolved anything, and they ended only through exhaustion. Now, I think that's it, false now, in a very important way. It's not false in every sense. The wars did go on for a very long time. Many battles had to be fought. The Seven Years' War took seven years. The War of the Austrian Succession lasted even longer than that, 12 years. Um, but what we must first of all recognize is that even though the result, those wars seem from the point of view of military history indecisive, from the point of view of legal history or geopolitical history, they were actually remarkably decisive. So the people who say that 18th century wars were not decisive are contrasting the practice of 18th century war in particular with the, with the practice of Napoleonic War. And Napoleon is supposed to have introduced decisive warfare, and I can go into more details about what's involved. What we must recognize, though, about Napoleon's wars is that they produced results that lasted no more than a decade. He was not able to redraw any borders. The striking thing about this more law-laden, not completely law-dominated, but law-laden warfare of the 18th century is that it produced results that have lasted down into the present. As a legal matter, it actually was much more successfully decisive than the more militarily decisive warfare that followed. And I think that's critically important, and I would insist, as I do in, in the book, that it was more legally decisive because there was more law in it from the beginning. And in understanding how they were fought, we must also understand something about both the Seven Years' War and the War of the, Austrian, uh, of the Spanish Succession, or of these other wars for that matter. I said that I hadn't said anything about it in the end of the talk. The decision about whether there had been a decision was entrusted in effect to diplomats. So that what you got, I, the diplomacy plays a major role in all of this. Almost from the moment the wars start, the diplomats begin gathering in The Hague and negotiating about what the consequences of the various battles are. And eventually, it's through diplomatic negotiation that these, that these verdicts are translated into treaty reality. Now, as you say, it's a limited reality. It's a limited reality. Maria Theresa never thought she was bound. That's absolutely true. We are, as I say, in the far borderlands of the law. There are limits to what the law can achieve. Nevertheless, I come back to what I said before. The main thing is that they kept it within the battle procedure, even when they were challenging it. And then in the end, the 18th century established the independence of the United States, drew the hexagon boundaries of France, established Germany or Prussia at the time as a great power. It actually succeeded in doing things that lasted much better than supposedly more decisive warfare ever succeeded in doing. So that's my answer to your, the first question. And the second question, I'm sorry, I forgot. And the technological thing. Now, I want to say two things about that. Once again, I don't mean to deny that technology after 1870 became the kind of driving force that it's become, but I just deny that it's an explanation of what happened in the mid-19th century. I do want to say one thing, though. Whether the, there is a critical question. We have to answer two questions. One, is the technology a technology of general devastation of the kind you're describing? Right? Which is one question. The second question is, does it make it impossible to fight pitched battles? Now, what I want to insist is, the follow on is the following. Technologies of general devastation are not the creation of modern carpet bombing. The Thirty Years' War was a war of general devastation. It was just as bad to be invaded in your home in 1625, and people died at a higher rate in Central Europe 
as it was in later wars. So that, that's not the right way of testing the destructiveness of the technology. The only question that matters for my purposes here is whether there's a technology like machine guns that make it impossible to confront each other on the battlefield. That technology didn't exist yet in the 1860s or 1870s. It did exist in 1914. And that's all that I'm saying and trying to answer a very narrow question why they couldn't do what they'd done in the 18th century, confine it procedurally to the battlefield. If I'll take another question. Yeah. Well, it's a constitutional monarchy. I mean, there's no, I, I mean, it's not, it's still not a republic. But, um, but I, I admit, having said that, I admit that I've only given a, you know, a, a very, very short form account of why monarchy might matter. I think it's the only explanation of the phenomenon that I'm talking about, but I agree entirely that you have to dig much more deeply into the phenomenon to be able to give a proper analysis to it. I agree with that entirely, and, and I, you know, I can toss out, I mean, there's lots to say about monarchy that I haven't said, that's absolutely true, but they certainly understood themselves to be a monarchy. Now, I, the, I haven't read your book, so I, mean, uh, I, just, uh, I just figured that you're sort of saying that, that republicanism sort of makes wars more bloody and so forth, that I guess I was just confused if Britain became a little bit more republican uh, before they, the 18th century. I mean, it became Republican in, in the middle of the 17th century. With what consequences, I don't know. I mean, the problem is, if you're talking about 17th century wars, religion plays such a huge role. And, and of course, I, maybe it's obvious, I regard religion as the kind of great cause that causes problems. I mean, I don't, I don't see how these military practices, practices can survive the kind of religious conflict you had in the 17th century. Not to deny, by the way, that there was religious conflict in the 18th century. There was. It's been downplayed too much. I mean, everybody understood that the first Silesian War was between the Protestant Frederick and the Catholic Maria Theresa. That's why we have a town called King of Prussia in Philadelphia, you know, because, because he was a Protestant hero. But still, the, but, but still, I mean, I, I just, it's possible that if you looked at, at the Anglo-Dutch Wars, you know, the first Anglo-Dutch War, you would say, well, look, this is republics or, or something. And it, it might be, although, you know, they're mostly, I also didn't talk about naval warfare because I think that raises lots of other questions too. They're mostly naval warfare. I, I just don't know, but my, because I haven't done the work, but my inclination is to say in the mid, middle of the wars of religion, the issues are so, are swamped, what I'm talking about are swamped by other problems. When we get to the end of the 17th century, I, you know, I think that they, they, was, they were very consciously a monarchy. They'd been through the Republican nonsense in the 1640s, 1650s. They didn't want to do it again. And I, I, that was just a monarchy. Um, go ahead. Um, when you said that they thought there would be a fight for terms of uh, matters of chance, yeah. did all monarchs actually think that's called co consciousness or think it's chance? Well, it's not just chance. So they have a lot of literature about this, and it involves, as it happens, a lot of Christian theology, believe it or not. Um, do you want to hear about the Christian theology? I'm not sure. But the, the, the basic Christian teaching for a long time, because uh, this was understood as akin to, I mean, you, it had a theological analysis attached to it. The basic Christian teaching is that you're not allowed to allow chance to decide things where human effort could decide them. So the basic Christian teaching was, so you can't just flip a coin in order to decide things. That's a demonic practice. If it's possible to resolve it, you can only do that if there's no possible way for human effort to resolve things. So that influenced thinking about the law of war too. So the general understanding was it's not pure chance. If it were pure chance, that would be theologically unacceptable. You have to inject some human effort into it. And they all knew they were injecting human effort into it, right? So Frederick the Great invested a lot in improving his artillery, in drilling his men, in coming up with new tactics. And it was understood that that influence the outcome. At the same time, everybody thought of these battles, I will insist, and I give you lots of literature on it, in much the way, since this is Austin, people think about football games today, right? I mean, you know, on any given day, it's always possible that, what should I choose? What, what, what university should never defeat the University of Texas? I don't know. Any. What? <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, that San Antonio Community College might defeat the University of Texas. 
because there is, an, an, as I say, an irreducible element of chance. And that's what they understood. And it's not just that the irreducible element of chance is there, but I, I spent some time on this in the, the legal philosophy of it. It's because there's chance that they're willing to accept the verdict. That is, there is a hardwired, perhaps particularly especially among human males or among females, there is a hardwired willingness to accept the results of a bet. It's quite remarkable, and we see this in legal institutions going very, very, very far back in human history. So the earliest legal institutions we, we see are often bets. You, you bet on the result, and then people remarkably accept the result of the bet. And we still see that in particular, you have what are called combat wagers. Combat wagers get fought all the time. We see them in lots of hum early human legal institutions. And as is so often the case, in the international scene, we tend to see forms that you otherwise only see in primitive law that have vanished elsewhere. Now, this remains the combat wager. And what can I say? I mean, we're all humans here. Humans have an amazing willingness to accept the result of a bet. You see it in gambling behavior all the time. And that's another critical part of why these guys would, would submit, because they'd made a bet and they lost. You make a bet, you lose. That's the end. Go ahead, Tom. Well, so I, you know, I read Kenneth like 30 years ago. It didn't even occur to me to read him again, but I, it sounds like I agree. Um, so and as, for, you know, as for whether you can improve the situation with modern democracies, I mean, it's tough. I, I, and I, it takes things me into areas that are well beyond my expertise. What, what I would say is this. Kant, I think, really didn't understand the dynamic at stake. He thought that monarchs reinforce their legitimacy by going to war, but that in republics there would be no felt need to reinforce legitimacy by going to war. That's really wrong. Right? It's really not true. The legitimacy of particular regimes, I mean think of the Falkland Islands War or something like that, of particular regimes and even more broadly of democracies does seem to depend on going to war. That's part of the, that's involved in the phenomenon I I described before, I think that is the idea that wars are fought for great causes like democracy. And the implicit understanding for Americans is that if our democracy has legitimacy here at home, it's because it's so great that we have to bring it to everybody, right? Whatever it may take. All of that is, I think, closely akin, or I would suggest closely akin, to the ways in which monarchs used war to reinforce their legitimacy. That that connection between legitimacy and warfare hasn't gone away. It doesn't go away in democracies, and the only way to attack the dangers that we're seeing, it seems to me, in the, in the, in the democracies, is to sever the link somehow. But I don't, I, nobody seems to have done it, and I don't know how you would do it. I mean, there, we, we, we certainly, we haven't had the sort of horrible wars in the, you know, rich countries in the northern part of the globe, for the most part, since World War II, but I take it that that's mostly because of nuclear weapons and not because of anything else. And, that's a, you know, a frightening but successful way of doing it, but that's right. So, but is there any way to so, so the, the, the limited answer that I try to give in the book just has to do with extracting yourself from the war after a certain number of years. That is, my sense is that the best thing you can do, and it comes back to the question about legitimacy, the best thing you can do is sit down and negotiate in a way that allows both sides to feel they're coming away with something. And so that you can go home to the voters or whoever it is and say, look, we got oil rights or something like that. Right? Because you are, again, not going to be able to sever the link between maintaining legitimacy of the regime at home and the ability to claim victory abroad. 
the advantage of taking, but that's only an advantage when it comes to negotiating an end to the war. And I don't want to make claims anywhere beyond that. Whether you can really negotiate with, you know. Even if you decided to be rational about your materialistic. You know, I, I, it, I, I'm not going to tell you that I, that I have the key, the answer to everything. I'm not sure that I do. I have predispositions, I, which are kind of a lawyer's predispositions. I think most of the time, after a while, people are willing to negotiate and settle, and anybody's willing to negotiate and settle. It is critically important that in doing it, they manage to maintain their legitimacy. They have to be able to claim they got something. Nobody walks away being declared the total loser happy. Right? I mean, and again, I would, if I were really a specialist, a specialist in this, I would be inclined to apply it to you know, the most insoluble problem, um, Israel and the, Palestine, and the Palestinians. Look, part of the problem is the Israelis will not allow the Palestinians ever to claim any kind of victory at all. You know, let them go home and say, we won something. I say that as a partisan of Israel, fundamentally. You know. That's a much better basis for making peace. It might not work in that case. It might not work in the other cases. But I come to this with a kind of a, a faith in dickering and, and negotiating, which may be misplaced, but I'm actually quite attached to. Uh, so. Right. Well, I mean, so the, the first engagement with Iraq, it's such a polite way to refer to it, the first engagement with Iraq. I mean, the, the, first, the, the first engagement with Iraq, I don't know how much I want to claim here because really I don't want to exaggerate my expertise in talking about these problems, right? But the first engagement with Iraq looks to me much more like an 18th century engagement in the sense that it was founded in a certain kind of legal claim. The war was used as a desperate last resort procedure, but as a kind of procedure to, to to, to vindicate the territorial claims on behalf of Kuwait. That's it. We didn't claim to do more than that. And, you know, we got to an end point. Now, we still had no fly zone. Yeah, we had all kinds of things going on, so it's more complicated than that. But still, we got to an end point. That wasn't true, obviously, of the second encounter, <laughs> dance, <laughs> I don't know what it was, with, with Iraq. And, you know, and there, I have things to say that don't follow from any of this project. I mean, obviously, I, the, 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 the second Iraq war, the second Gulf War, whatever you want to call it, was driven by high ideals. And it's, to my mind, a classic example. And I believe that the, the, those who the, the Bush administration claims of fighting in the name, I think they were fighting in the name of high ideals. I think they really thought that once you get rid of the autocrat, everybody would spring up and, and want freedom and free markets. And they, they really thought that, you know, and that that was a good thing. And I, I you know, you, you can, I don't know enough about it to say. I, I'm against that attitude toward war. I would much rather fight wars in the name of national interest. I think that makes much more sense. I think it was manifestly not in our national interest to fight that war, partly because well, Saddam was what stood between us and Iran. I mean, that's what Saddam thought, and his calculation was the correct calculation. Ours was the wrong calculation. I prefer those kinds of calculations. But again, that doesn't follow from anything I've said in the book or, or, or say today. Those are really prejudices by somebody who's not deeply informed about those wars. Thank you. It's got a great cover. Don't miss the cover. Thanks so much.